Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show, where we give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California. And I'm constantly amazed that every day, Ashley Mova like, has a completely different outfit. I have three shirts. Do I really? Like, you I always look like totally repeating. different and totally oh, good. Stop it. Thanks, John. Also, you're Ken Napsok. I bought this shirt at Structure in 2001. <laughs> 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 also, here, Jeremy John. I got nothing to follow these geniuses up. How you doing? It's uh, it's not even Monday. I almost said it's Monday. It's not Monday. It's no, it's it's Wednesday. To I you almost it said. Is. All right, to correct it, to I almost said Tuesday. To the guy who wakes Tuesday. up at the crack of right. noon most days. Yeah, yes, no, it, it feels no, like I would, Monday. Mm, mm, right. Haven't done that in months. <laughs> Christian Harloff, tell us about your wardrobe. Oh, thanks for that wonderful introduction. Um, this uh, <laughs> structure, is it still open? No, no. What happened to structure? What is structure? Can we do a structure show? It became Express for Men at one point. Oh. <laughs> all right. The answer is that there are a lot of clones of Ashley Mova. Uh, uh -huh. All right, listen, guys. Um, we have, of course, our whole lineup here of stories that we want to do, but a couple of trailers have dropped, including one we're going to talk about here first. A Despicable Me 3 trailer dropped. Now, we've already seen one or two of them. I... Look, I really like the Despicable Me movies. Wasn't that big of a fan of the Minions movie. Uh, and these trailers have been okay, but today was the first one that I was like completely entertained all the way through. They had a lot of really good gags. It looks like the whole... I, I was iffy on the idea of Gru having a twin brother, Drew. This trailer sold me on it. And the scene with the little girl talking about the unicorn, that just made my whole face light up. I, was, I like this trailer a lot. I'm looking forward to this movie more and more. What do you think I about it? I totally agree with you. I, I didn't like a lot of the stuff that I had seen. I think that I had, I was very excited for the Minions movie. I was very let down by the Minions movie. And to now see the way that they used them in this trailer was exactly how I wanted them to use them. Just pepper them in there, show me that it's not another Minion movie, that they're gonna focus on Gru and the girls, and now a brother. The thing with Despicable Me 1 and 2 was the notion of family and how to, he always he was looking for his mother's approval. He was he was a loner. He had to find these kids, and then he finds a girlfriend. Now this is the thing with the brother. I think it's, it is consistent with what they've done. I love the second one even better than the first, so I'm encouraged now by the third trailer. Jeremy, you just saw the trailer. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I've enjoyed the Despicable Me movies thus far. I think the people who are married and married and have kids love them more than, than <laughs> we single curmudgeonous folk, especially we single curmudgeonous folk who are like, I just saw a Spider-Man Homecoming trailer. Yeah, Despicable Me, this is fine. Spider-Man Homecoming, that trailer is great. So, uh, but I do, I do enjoy the trailer, and I agree with you. It has a family dynamic that they always up. I think bringing his brother in. Anytime there's a, a story l like this where they bring in a brother is always it's always a fun dynamic. Yeah. It's brotherly com camaraderie. There's like nothing like it in the world. It's a very specifically brotherly thing, you know. To, so to see him go through that, I think it'll be fun. Um, yeah, I think I'll enjoy it. I just hope that they don't do the old. Uh, what the brother was really the bad guy the whole time. Yeah, it's yeah. I just want them cliche. to be like just idiots the entire time. Yeah. You know what I mean? Together. Yeah. Ken, you saw. What do you think? These movies make me want to get a vasectomy. <laughs> <laughs> um, they hit all the points. It's great. The, the girl thing's cute. The unicorn. Mm, I've seen girls do that in real life. And men. It's uh, everyone that gets excited for unicorns. I get it. These movies are good. Like Jeremy. Right. <laughs> I'd rather go to the bar, have some chips and salsa and a whiskey, and not worry about the minions. <laughs> we are, but look out at there, our if, you, if you enjoy them, you go enjoy these movies. This looks good. The trailer is good. I like Steve Carell. I love Kristen Wiig. There's a lot of funny people in there. Do your thing. Make your dreams come true. <laughs> All right. There's another trailer that came out. Ashley, <gasps> tell us about it. Marvel Studios has revealed two versions of a brand new Spider-Man Homecoming trailer, one domestic and one international, as well as two new posters to go along with the release. Directed by cop car Helmer John Watts, Homecoming features the return of your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man to the MCU, where he battles one of his most famous villains from the comics, Vulture, alongside Tony Stark's Iron Man. Spider-Man Homecoming star Tom Holland, Robert Downey Jr., Michael Keaton, Zendaya, John Favreau, Don Glover, and Tyne Daly. It opens in theaters on July 7th, 2017. John, thoughts on the new trailer and posters for Spider-Man Homecoming? I thought it was, the, the opening of the trailer is so creative. The idea of the events of Civil War and he's like doing selfie videos with it, that was really clever and it set the tone for me for the entire trailer. We saw a couple of things in there that we've seen in other trailers already, but there was a lot of new stuff in there. We started to catch more of the motivation of what the Vulture is going to be and how just some dude start to put this thing together. 
that makes sense. That's good stuff to put into a trailer. It was fun. It was exciting. I love the little backflip over thing. And the introduction of Hap into it oh, was, funny. was wonderful. The whole Thin Walls line was great. I think this might actually might be the best trailer they put out yet. So, yeah, very excited about it. What do you think, Jeremy? The first half of this trailer is the best trailer they've put out yet. I, I like you. I love the, the selfie thing. He's doing his vlogging, you know? Yeah, Favreau's like, we have Thin Walls here. You know, he <laughs> cracked me up. I love the causality. I, I saw that... For the first time, a, a comic book movie that really brought it on course that with heroes come more villains was Batman Begins, you know, when Gordon uh, tells him about escalation. Mm -hmm. So anytime you have a causality like that, like you can argue the war on drugs creates more drugs, war on terror creates more terror, superheroes create supervillains, you know? And so there's this guy, like all this alien tech out there, we're going to become supervillains now. Be, you know, I just like the linked causality of all of it. The next half of the trailer shows me a bit too much per what Spider-Man trailers usually do, and I could have done without that. But generally speaking, for that first half of the trailer, it was the best Spider-Man trailer. Ken, what do you think about I it? I enjoy the neo-political Jeremy Johns we got here today. <laughs> here. Uh, I agree with what you guys are saying. This movie makes me excited to, sp uh, this trailer, it makes me excited to see Spider-Man. The first trailer, I thought was a little bit of a, of a Tony Stark. Hey, he's in this movie. You like Tony Stark. You like Iron Man. All right, this one, I didn't get that sense. Yes, Iron Man's very pre prevalent. I love Favreau back. That's a great line. But this got me excited to see their version of Spider-Man because mm -hmm. it, it was creative. It was different. Do I agree, agree that the trailer at the end kind of mm -hmm. uh, connects some dots? But... I love Michael Keaton, man. Yeah. Come on. This yeah. guy, ever since Dream Team in 1988, 89, <laughs> one of my favorite you comedies of all movie. time. I love Dream Team. I love seeing Keaton go at it. Uh, it's going to be fun. And, and, and for me, someone who sometimes is on the outside of, of superhero movies, this... This seems interesting. Whether or not it still has Act 1, Act 2, Act 3, of course it is a superhero movie. But that, that device, John, like you said at the beginning, that was creative. That was fun, and I enjoyed it. This is a very smart trailer, and the reason why is, for marketing purposes, we all forget that, like, like I said a couple of weeks ago, when I talked to my neighbor about this movie, uh, Spider-Man, he's like, nah, the last two weren't very good, and had no idea that these were how these were connected. Like, the casual movie fan might not know about all this stuff. If they didn't see Civil War, they wouldn't know. Sitting in a, in a movie theater, and you see this trailer, it is clear this is part of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It, it, the plot connects to the plot of the Avengers and other things that had happened. So it is a very, it, this is a, this trailer was a very Marvel-centric movie, uh, movie, and I think that uh, that got me right away. I I agree with Jeremy 100%, though. The second half of it, even though the stuff that we saw was cool, you can pretty much start to piece together. We've seen enough of these movies that, okay, well, it looks like the he's got the crappy costume towards the end of the movie because Tony's telling him at this one thing that happens in the beginning that he hasn't lived up to his potential. And then at the end, Tony Stark helps him out and then he gives him back the suit. You piece that together from this trailer. I didn't think you needed that. I thought the first half was really good. The trailer overall was was fantastic, but I think they just gave you a little bit too much that I didn't think they needed to give you. All right, let's move on with finally our first official story of the day. It's been years since we've heard about any movement for the long in development Top Gun 2. But now Maverick himself has buzzed the tower with a definitive update. Speaking with Sunrise 7 News in Australia promoting his latest The Mummy, Tom Cruise went on record to confirm that Top Gun 2 is actually happening, with Cruise saying they're probably going to start filming in the next year. Back in June of 2015, it was revealed that Skydance's David Ellison was coming on to produce, hiring Jungle Book writer Justin Marks to pen the script that is said to involve drone technology as well as the end of an era in dogfighting and fighter pilots. No word yet on when the film will begin production or who might be directing. John, thoughts on Tom Cruise's confirmation about Top Gun 2? Well, I, I gotta admit, when I first saw Tom Cruise making the announcement, I, like, I, it piqued my interest. I was like, oh, wow. But the more I thought about it overnight and everything, I realized I think this is a case of too little too late. I just don't think anybody's asking for this movie anymore. And, you know, I, I'm just not... Here's the funny thing. I was mentioning this to uh, at our staff meeting earlier. Normally when a big piece of news drops, I'll get like 20, 30, 40 tweets from different people sending, John, have you seen this? Have you seen this? Have you seen this? I got one person, like this is literally one person tweeted the news about, or to me at any rate, the news about Top Gun. I, I really just think this is something they should have done 10 years ago. And I would have been super excited. About it. Even five years ago, I think I might have been excited about it. But at this point, it's just a different landscape now. Like, I, I guess Tom Cruise will take on the Tom Skerritt kind of role and all that kind of stuff. I don't know what they're going to do. But, I mean, when Scott died, I mean, I, I, right there, a lot of my interest in a sequel dropped. But I was still into it. 
I'm just not sensing that anybody cares. I wouldn't be surprised if the studio realizes, hey, we had Tom Cruise make this announcement and nobody seems to be caring. I wouldn't actually be shocked if they don't move ahead with it. I mean, they probably will, but I wouldn't be surprised if they don't. Anyway, Ken, you heard about this. What do you think? I'll make a bet with you guys right now. If this movie hits theaters, the four of us hit the beach and play a game of home <laughs> <erotic> <laughs> volleyball. No. I, I, I agree with you. Tom Cruise, uh, I'm sure this is, he's not, well, I don't know, maybe Tom Cruise just randomly say things he wants in interviews. But um, <laughs> uh, even five years ago, John, even five years ago, it was like, huh? But yeah. the hit, and the story they're pitching, they've been pitching for five years. Long Actually, time. sounds interesting. Sounds like it would make some sort of sense. Uh, I, I can get behind that idea, but we, we saw with some of the other movies, Independence Day, of course, comes to mind, that eh, maybe Top Gun was a bigger pop cultural hit in the 80s. I don't know, but I, I, I just don't think we need it, and I, think, and I don't want to pull the old guy car, but I think there's an entire generation of fans who are like, I think my Uncle Steve likes that movie. <laughs> uh, I don't care. <laughs> I don't disagree with you two farts. I think that this movie is something that fans will want. I think that with a new spin on it and the way they're going to make it kind of, they're going to modernize it a little bit too because let's let's call it what it is. I love the first Top Gun. You watch it now. Yeah. It's, a, it's a cheesy movie though. You watch it. It's, I love it. And I can watch it tomorrow or today and still love it, but it's a cheesy movie. Um, they are gonna, they're going to change that because the difference though, Ken, is that this isn't just 10, 15 years of Ben Stiller saying, all right, now I'm going to do Zoolander because Ben Stiller is somewhat relevant. He's not still doing big action movies or big comedies all the time and hitting the way that Tom Cruise is hitting with action movies. Jack Reacher, too. But Mission Impossible, really good. I mean, we're going to do uh, Live, Die, Repeat, all over the place, whatever it's called, that second movie. But he's still relevant as an action star. So if they can do that, plus Justin Marks, who I have personal experience with the whole Masters of the Universe, but also did very well with Jungle Book, is a really good writer. He was also supposed to be working on Voltron. He's a kid of that of that generation. He knows kind of how to spin that into another direction and with Cruz and whoever they have producing. I think it'd be really cool. And I think just because it's the Top Gun name, we're going, ah, it might be a little a little too uh, too late, like you guys are saying. But if you see a good opening, good trailer with, oh, wait a minute, that's what they're doing now, and they're making it more relevant today, who cares what it's called as long as it's a good movie and I think they could sell it. Jeremy. Yeah, it is a situation I have to make the call based on the information I have. And based on the information I have, I always find it interesting when the premise of this movie that's like 20 years later after the original is, oh, the times are changing and the, the the era of our old ways is dying like you know the the drones are basically yeah. the new wave of the of uh of the dog fighting's dead and whatnot and we're just kind of uh, we're obsolete is going to be the theme anytime i hear that's going to be the premise in a movie i'm always interested and when i watch it it's very few times as a payoff i end up walking out going okay so indiana jones was past his prime I, it wasn't as good as i wanted it to be so i got to be skeptical i agree the trailer could be good and if it is a good trailer i'll get interested but until i have that trailer I'm I can't get excited about it. I have Top Gun 1. I'm with you, though. It's like I can watch the movie tomorrow. It's right. a cheesy movie, but that's for Top Gun 1. I feel like we're going to hit another Wall Street money never sleeps thing. The only thing, though, with that, the difference is, and we've said this about Tom Cruise a million times, because if you look at, uh, I love Harrison Ford, but mm -hmm. for a long time, he's been just kind of phoning it in, and he was Harrison Ford in Indiana Jones. He, that wasn't Indiana Jones. He was just going through the motions. I've never seen Tom Cruise go through the motions. You're right. Tom Cruise commits 110% every single time from good to bad, and he goes into it because his philosophy on what the or given for the fans, what the fans spending money, I think it's going to go all out. I think this could be a really cool movie. I'll just uh, watch Stealth. <laughs> oh my God. All right. What's next? <laughs> According to Deadline, Skyfall and Spectre director Sam Mendes is in early Deadline. talks to direct Disney's live action Pinocchio from a script by Rogue One writer Chris Weitz. Mendez was also in talks to direct the live-action adaptation of Roald Dahl's James and the Giant Peach for Disney. However, there's no mention of that project, so it's unclear if Mendez is still attached to direct. With Mendez possibly on board, the project will represent yet another project from Disney that is seeing their old animated movies rebooted into live-action form. Pinocchio has not been dated for a release at this time. Christian, thoughts on a live-action Pinocchio directed by Sam Mendez? I, I like it, and it's, you know, the thing is with... Pinocchio, and I can't remember because I know for a long time Paul Thomas Anderson was supposed to do it with Robert Downey Jr., but I think that was a different version. I don't know if that was the Disney version. I might be wrong. Um, but Pinocchio is one that, and it's, it's, I'm looking at like the marketing, the way Disney does this stuff. And Pinocchio came out on Blu-ray, I think, like six months ago yeah, or five months, months ago, whatever ago, yeah. it was. And they're, and they're trying to get it back into the consciousness of the public. And I think that that's what they do. I think they did that with Cinderella. They did the Snow White. I'm, uh, they're going to stay away from because it's been done a billion times now. But 
Pinocchio is something that I think um, it could work. And Sam Mendes is a good director. As well. I don't. I think you're going to have an announcement pretty soon that Guy Ritchie is not directing Aladdin. I think that's going to happen. But Mendes, I think, if you attach him to something, what what he's done in his style, I think you could actually really work with the story of Pinocchio. What do you think, Ken? Yeah, there's a certain morality and depth to the Pinocchio tale, as with most of those fairy tales that have bigger points. Uh, I'm going back. I mean, I'm a big fan of American Beauty, one of my all-time favorite movies. I know a lot of people out there probably love that. That's Mendes is, you know, coming out of the swing and with his first movie there. I love that. Um, it, this, this, uh, I, I, I'm starting to gloss over. I love what Disney's doing. They're making money. I think these are the new December movies for them. You know, we've talked about maybe that's why they might be moving Star Wars off. Um, but it's like, uh, and I'm starting to gloss over because it's just like every property is going to be re mm. rebooted for me. So I'm just like, I want to wait to see it. I want you know we're we gonna get a you know Vin Diesel stars as Mr. Toad, Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. Maybe we do. I don't know. <laughs> uh, but I do love Mendes's work. I I love uh, Skyfall, Spectre. Disappointing, but still looked great. Still had that big feel to it. So yeah, combine that big beautiful feel with some uh, stuff he can do with the storytelling. Away We Go is another movie of his that I yeah. I thought was pretty good. That on a smaller intimate scale, you get some of that stuff, and you could turn a, a puppet into a real boy. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Jeremy? You know, uh, I bought Pinocchio when it came out on Blu-ray recently, and I watched it. I'm like, this is a fucked up story. Like, it's really messed up. My it's, brother, Yeah, it's twisted. My brother texted me probably three days ago. It sounds like he watched it. He was like, dude, how did we survive? You know, like, how did we watch this and grow up normal human beings? Like, there's a guy, they never come back as boys. And his face turns red, and his hair looks like horns. He has, like, weird shadowy imps working for him, caging up donkeys that used to be kids. It's a really messed up story. And as long as they keep that darkness, I don't want them to be like, okay, that was a bit too messed up. We got to go a bit of a lighter tone. I want them to keep all the dark shit yeah. in this story. The they whale do part. That. The monstrel is scary when he's yeah. he's writhing in the That's water. Cool. Like, yeah. Dude, I, I'm telling you, I, just, I blacked out a few months ago when I watched it, and I woke up a couple hours later. I was like, what happened? I just don't that know That ride happened. is scary. Disneyland. Yeah, it's you great. Know. Oh, yeah. it's awesome. You know, so as long as I keep all the messed up stuff, I think this could be a really cool one. It's unlike any other Disney movie that I can really think of, and it can actually do something that those other Disney movies really can't because it was made in a time where people, people didn't care. They're like, we're going to mess kids up good it's good for him it'll give him moxie and it's yeah. like that's that you know so as long as i keep that i'm actually pretty interested in this i can just think about that well seeing how it would absolutely transfer as a feature film yeah. like that that could be a really cool scene all right guys we reached out part of the show now for buy or sell here's how this works in front of her ass she's got a few other items in the world of movie news she's going to run them down then those at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell so ashley what do we got According to a report from Variety, Edge of Tomorrow director Doug Liman has exited as director of Justice League Dark, DC's film's adaptation of its Dark Justice League team-up that consists of John Constantine, Swamp Thing, Deadman, Zatanna, and Etrigan the Demon. Sources for Variety say Liman left the project over scheduling issues for Lionsgate's Chaos Walking, starring Daisy Ridley, which just received a green light. The report states that the studio has already started meeting with other directors with THR Boris Kitt saying in a late night tweet that it director Andy Muschietti is on the list of possible replacements. Jeremy, with Lyman out, would you buy or sell it director Andy Muschietti to direct Justice League Dark? Uh, I'd buy that. I read Justice League Dark for its first probably 30 something issues and I really dug it. I mean, it's, it's, it's a neat ensemble. It's like the Justice League, but the really dark, magical version of it. And so it needs to have that messed up kind of horror element to it. In a situation like this, I will always go, yeah, give me tone over big sci-fi, you know, big action things. You know, if I want my big action stuff, I'll go to the actual Justice League. I want this to be a bit more of a horror vibe, but you do have to make it feel like a Justice League slash horror. It sounds hard, but that's why it's interesting if they can pull it off. Um, I'm totally buying this. I've wanted this movie done ever since Guillermo del Toro was like, I'm interested right. in doing it. I think he would have been perfect. He's out. Uh, I, yes, I buy this for sure. Give me Justice League Dark. Yeah, I'm going to buy it because I think it's a nice move by the studio to go after the director of it because mm -hmm. they're paying attention. Maybe they've seen the cut of the movie. I assume that they have. But they also are going after the buzz of the movie, how, many, how much it's been viewed just that the trailer, trailer alone. Crushed it. Um, and by going after a younger talent like that and an up-and-coming talent like that for a project like this, it's given, it's given a, uh, the guy a shot to play in even, even the bigger leagues than he is. So I think that that's, that's an interesting choice. I like when newer directors who already prove themselves got a shot to do something to the mainstream audience also. Not that it isn't mainstream, but it's not as mainstream as like a DC property right now. So uh, and, and I don't know. I'm not going to pretend that I know enough about Justice mm -hmm. League Dark. I don't. But hearing what you're saying, if, it, if it's going down like this 
darker uh, th thriller horror type genre, then he seems to be right. the right type of fit. So maybe Lyman wasn't the guy that they wanted in the first place. Uh, I'm going to buy this, and there's a, couple, there's a couple interesting things. One, they're going for like kind of a true horror director for that, which is interesting. Now, I haven't seen it, but I did see Mama. And he did a really good job with mine. You mentioned Guillermo del Toro was the mm -hmm. first guy to mention Justice League Dark. He worked with Guillermo del Toro on Mama, yeah. who was the producer of that film as well. So this is a really interesting thing about, I mean, we could go into the narrative, okay, yet another director boarding and leaving a DC property. But this idea of Michelle come on, this could be a really nice fit, maybe even a better fit than this one would have been. So yeah, I'm all for it. I buy it. What do you think, Ken? Uh, I'm not familiar with Justice League Dark. Could you teach me, Jeremy? Who, who's the one over Lyman's shoulder there? The female with the... the tenant. That's the kind of woman I've been trying to date for 40 years, so <laughs> I'm on board. But um, I'm going to break this up. I buy the idea of the director. Uh, I like that idea. Um, you're selling me on the tone, if that's what's needed. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I'm not familiar with the property. Right. I, I'm overall selling the idea of just these directors coming in and out of these big superhero projects. I want these directors to get the credit. I want Patty Jenkins to get credit for Wonder Woman. I want that to be hers. But sometimes I feel like everything's in place with the studio. Warner Brothers, DC, Marvel. It's just, all right, now you sit here, tell people where to go. We'll take care of the rest. I know that's not 100% true, but you know what I mean? Sometimes mm -hmm. these guys get pulled off. I like Lyman's work. Who doesn't like swingers, baby? But um, I, I'm just selling overall. But I'll buy Andy as a what, machete? That's a great name. <laughs> that's a great name. Uh, I buy him because, hey, give another uh, young person a chance. Right? I like that you remembered this time that Lyman directed swingers. <laughs> I learned from my Schmodown mistakes, Christian. All right, what's next? 20th Century Fox has unveiled two new War for the Planet of the Apes TV spots online. Director Matt Reeves returns for the follow-up, which picks up a few years after the events of Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, where an all-out war between the humans and the apes is underway. Caesar, played by Andy Serkis, sets out to exact revenge against the Colonel, played by Woody Harrelson, who has amassed a massive human army at a compound deep in the snow. The film also stars Steve Zahn and Judy Greer and opens in theaters on July 14th. Can buy or sell the new TV spot for War for the Planet of the Apes. Buy, 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 buy. It is uh, looking good. These movies, these franchises, this franchise is uh, so just, uh, it's, it's so, just, girl, I just want to hug it because I love it so much. Because <laughs> it's, um, it's just so real. I, I, even now, I look at that and I think those are those are real apes, right? They're real, real apes on horses. Just so good. And look at the, is that one in like a puffy vest my dad wore in the 70s? Yeah, that's Dobby. Dobby? Yes, that's yeah, Dobby. Dobby. Uh, no, these trailers are good. They're so well. I love that moment with, did you come to, for your apes? No, I came for you. Like, ooh, we're going to have a fight. Also, how Woody's shaving his head in the morning, that's how I get ready for uh, work, too. So uh, <laughs> I'm buying it, baby. I'm buying it. Yeah, big buy for me. I mean, everything, they've, they've handled this marketing campaign pretty much flawlessly. I mean, just pretty much flawlessly. Like, they've never made a misstep with any of the TV spots, the trailers, even the posters are like that. Everything is building up to this thing great. This is another home run for them uh, as far as marketing standards go. Like, you know, look, maybe the movie will be great. Maybe it'll be horrible. Don't know. We're just talking about the spots, but the spots are tremendous, and I think should give you a lot of hope. So, for me, it's a buy. Fantastic, fantastic spot. Big buy. Uh, I, I agree with you. I love the way that not only have they marketed this movie, but the way in general that they've handled this franchise. I mean, the, the Planet of the Apes franchise in general was always, it was iconic for sure. But for the most part, it didn't really have the overall lore because it, 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 it was a victim of, its, of being dated and everything too. But what they've done in these two movies so far, now gearing up to his third, is just making this amazing lore. And the way that they've just, the character development with Caesar has been just incredible. So the other thing I got to give credit here is Matt Reeves because when Matt Reeves replaced Rupert uh, Wyatt, yeah, um, the first time around, I was I remember saying, I don't know, man, I, the guys. Let, the I first one was so good. Yeah, I just didn't know. And then I loved Dawn even better than the first one. And to have him back, and and I had a chance to speak to him once too, and having him and Andy Serkis talking to the two of them. They knew where this was going from the second they started talking about Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. They've been working on this thing, and they know this franchise. It's, this isn't just a job for either one of these guys. This is a, this is a, I am invested in this thing. We are telling a story we want to tell. This isn't a job. This is, this is absolute creative storytelling at its best, and you can see it in the trailer. What do you think, Jeremy? Yeah, all these, I remember when Rise of the Planet of the Apes was coming out. Yeah. And you and I, it was really kind of when we first started talking, yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, you saw it before I did, and I was like, you know, I mean, eh, well, we'll see what happens. You text me, you're like, you're going to love this movie. I was like, get out of town. Like, that's an impossibility. And then right. I watched it. It was one of my favorite movies that year. It's been, if they la if they stick this landing, it will be one of the best trilogies out there, like I've been saying. And it's, 
a war like a war in general is 50% the war you're fighting 50% how you fight the war and Caesar is he's ultimately a victim of circumstances like I never wanted to fight anybody and they're yeah. handling that so well for you to be like I am straight up it's apes versus humans. I'm a human being, and I'm siding with the apes on this yeah. one, right? It's like they are the good guys, and I'm completely on their side because it's just Woody Harrelson looks like an animal, dude. He looks like he's going to handle this in all the wrong ways, and I love the fact that Dobby looks like he stole the clothes off of some kid from Stranger <laughs> Things to get his freedom. <laughs> right. Yeah. All right, what's next? According to a report from Entertainment Weekly, Rihanna and Lupita Nyong'o are set to star in a new movie for director Ava DuVernay after a tweet featuring the two went viral. This all happened after Rihanna and Nyong'o were pictured together at the Miu Miu fashion show back in 2014, which then turned into a Twitter sensation when people started joking that a movie should be made of the two. EW says that the Internet Created Project had, was pitched to studios at this year's Cannes Film Festival, with Netflix coming out on top after a very aggressive bid. It's unclear yet as to whether the film will follow the same idea as the initial tweet, which has received over 96,000 retweets. Netflix is eyeing the film for a 2018 release after DuVernay finishes her adaptation of A Wrinkle in Time. John Byersell, the new movie starring Rihanna and Lupita Nyong'o, directed by Ava DuVernay. I'm going to buy it for a couple of reasons. Number one, the way in which this whole thing came about is going to be the things they tell stories about mm -hmm. for years. I mean, it's incredible. Uh, mm -hmm. Reason number two, Lupita Nyong'o is just uh, kind of going back to what I was talking about with the apes and their marketing campaign. Lupita Nyong'o is flawless. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's unbelievable. And I know a lot of you guys still haven't seen Queen of Cotway. Like, watch that immediately because she's just, she'll just blow your mind in that. She's incredible. Um, and, of course, Ava DuVernay. Like, what else can you say? Obviously, I'm the one odd piece, if I'm playing the Sesame Street game of one of these things does not belong here, is Rihanna to me, who's a tremendously talented musical artist. I have just not liked her whenever she's popped up on the screen. I've, I've, I don't think she can act, I, so that's just me. But overall, as a package, this looks really cool, so I'm going to buy it. What do you think, Ken? I absolutely buy it. I do know what you're saying about Rihanna and performance, but uh, hey, put her in the hands of, of Ava with a great co-star. Let's see. Let's hope. I love how it started. Also, if you're the person who made that initial initial tweet, WGA West is located on 3rd and Fairfax. <laughs> you head over there now. Make your claim. Um, I, but seriously, though, what will they do? There's so many people adding to the story. If they go, if, if the story is anything close to some of those tweets, don't you have some kind of rights to it? I don't know, but I buy it absolutely. It's going to be what fun. What do you think, Jeremy? I, um, I have my head in the ground in the Twitterverse apparently. So how did this start? Someone tweeted something and then it led to a movie. Yeah, it's yeah. Pretty, much. pretty much how it happened. Yeah. You're right though. That's the, that's the power of social media right there. It's like, oh, we just did a business deal on Twitter. Like, who, <laughs> when has that ever happened? And and also uh, Ava DuVernay, uh, Lupita uh, Lupita Nyong'o, uh, both huge, and now they're in a Netflix. Uh, is a property. Yeah. I mean, that that just speaks more volumes as to how huge Netflix is going. It's one of these companies that just, if there is going to be the death of network television, it's going to be things like this, where it's just like, oh, we have all the streaming services that have everything. Why do we need your overpriced plan? So I feel like that day's coming soon. Moments like this are why. I love the fact that it's on Netflix. I love the people that got for it. And I love the fact that it all happened on Twitter. Baffling. What a time to be alive. Christian. Uh, I'm buying it because I love Ava DuVernay. Yeah, I not only not only just in general how talented talented she is, I love her work ethic. I love the way that she goes about things on social media. I love the way that she speaks her voice and certain things, the way she's able to put things together. And I love how powerful she's become, like her voice and the, how powerful her voice has become in such a short amount of time. Um, from a few movies here too, because A Wrinkle in Time hasn't even come out yet. And she's becoming that that voice, the people that they get behind, they stand behind, and she can do so. She's, she has the power to be able to be able to put together a movie off a tweet. Um, and get because she got that meeting. She's probably really good in the room. She probably, you know, the fact that she, there's so much you hear about her, and, and this is evidence of that. Lupita Nyong'o is someone that is a, is another one who has just come come over the last couple of years a superstar. You know, I agree with John though. I think that the one thing here is is Rihanna. She is, and I'll be a little uh, not as nice as you. She's a terrible actress. Um, <laughs> that Battleship. Was I mean I know it was a little while ago, she, and she was fine as voice acting, and she and the stuff she's done Saturday Night Live was iffy at best. If Avery Duvernay can make it work, and maybe Avery Duvernay is able to get that out of her, 
then let's see what happens. You know, so at this time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trust David DuVernay. But the other thing, I, I totally agree with Jeremy, with Martin Scorsese, Brad Pitt, Netflix is that, is that place now to where you say, well, this movie might not open up big. But because of this hype, because of the social media, and because of what we can do marketing on Netflix, it will be successful on Netflix. Okay, but this is this is really what we got to say. I think we're getting, I know I've, I'm guilty of this, we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, I think, with the Netflix thing. All that is happening right now is Netflix is throwing a lot of money around. Right. And giving some artists a place to make their movies that maybe other places didn't want to make. What Netflix is, what Netflix, Netflix has made movies with big stars. I mean, they made the big deal with Adam Sandler and all that kind of stuff. But so far, the movies that have come out in Netflix, with the big exception of being the uh, Idris Elba film, uh, right, Be uh, Beast, Beast of the Southern Wild, yeah, uh, Beast of No Nation, Sandler. no Nation, no Nation. Yeah, um, with the exception of that one, almost all the original films they've made on Netflix, and, and maybe I'm forgetting a couple of good ones. I'm just saying, off the top of my head, have been awful. They've been awful. They, it's great that they're throwing out the money to make these films, but before it becomes a game changer, and it, it very well may. Before it can happen, though, these movies got to end up being great. Oh, that I agree people with watch you. them and go, "Oh my God, this is quality!" Unlike the Adam Sandler stuff they've been. I totally on. agree with you, and I think that that's exactly what this shift is. If you want to call it like Phase Two, if you will, because that's why all these new announcements of this different type of talent. When you get a Martin Scorsese, you're not getting an Adam Sandler movie. You know, you're getting. They, they, I think that they're trying to definitely up the quality. And the, as far as throwing money at it, you know, you got you got to spend money to make money. Absolutely, it, no, it's the right move. Right, right, right. right. I, I'm agreeing with you. Everything you're saying, they need to make the good ones. They got to hope that the Brad Pitt one is good, that this one's going to turn out great, and then the Scorsese one does. And then once it starts getting that kind of recognition, it's it's going to be a brand new place to to make movies. Yeah, totally agree. All right, we still got another one. What's next? Sony Pictures announced yesterday that they have finally slated Elizabeth Banks' Charlie's Angels reboot for a June 7, 2019 release. Banks will also produce via her Universal-based Brownstone Productions with her husband and producing partner Max Handelman. Soon after the news broke, the tracking board reported that narco scribe Doug Miro and Carlo Bernard have brought in to rewrite the script and that Hidden Figures and Moonlight star Janelle Monet is at the top of the studio's wish list to play one of the angels. Christian, buy or sell the Charlie's Angels reboot directed by Elizabeth Banks for a summer 2019 release. I'm a big Elizabeth Banks fan. I am selling this hard. Uh, I don't want to see Charlie's Angels again. I don't I just I don't think it worked last time. Um, and I, I got to be honest, I, even though it made a lot of money, I didn't think Elizabeth Banks was a very good director. I, the Pitch Perfect 2, I, the, the biggest problem with the movie was the directing. It didn't have the same tone, the same fun that the first one did. Um, and again, I'm a big fan of Elizabeth Banks. I think there's other things I'd rather see her do. I just, just nothing about this that makes me want to see it. Um, Elizabeth Banks has some kind of dark necromancy power because <laughs> when she's in a, when I'm in a room with her, I am completely under her spell. She could, she could tell me, hey, go piss on Stipe Miocic's leg. That's the UFC heavyweight champion, by the way. And I would do it just because she said to do it. And I just, I just love her. I adore her. She's amazing. Pitch Perfect 2, you could tell, was directed by a first-time director. It, did, it was not. It didn't turn out to be. A t I didn't think it was a terrible movie, but it was not well directed. I liked the first Charlie's Angels movie. Um, I thought I thought it was a lot of fun. The second one, not so much. I, but because I'm just, I need to see her improve as a director before I'm going to get excited about her directing a movie. So right now, all I've seen of her is to directing one film. I didn't think it worked out very well. Hopefully, this next one, hopefully Charlie's Angels works out to be good, and I can change my opinion of her as a director. But as of right now, I don't have that positive experience with her as a director, so I got to sell it for now. What do you think? Well, I've, I've, what's that guy's name? The, the champion? Steve Miocic? Yeah, I've pissed on his leg for free. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> he's fine. He looked at me. He's like, you're the, yeah, it's fine. Whatever. <laughs> he, he lifted my car and threw it off a building after that. But it, it was fine. Uh, but I mean, honestly, I'm probably going to buy this just because I feel like if you look at Elizabeth Banks and Charlie's Angels, they're probably a pretty good fit. It's not like she's taken over Star Wars or Planet. Planet of the Apes or something like that. <laughs> I've never been a Charlie's Angels fan. I didn't dig either of the uh, of the movies. The show was before my time. The show they tried to reboot with Pam Anderson, I never saw. So it's, I mean, give her a shot with this. Then if it sucks, then be like, oh, I guess you can't direct ever. But I mean, in a world where I agree with you guys about Pitch Perfect 2, 
wasn't a big fan of it and the directing was not good but in that sense it's like all right maybe she should get another shot that's me going yeah i buy the fact that you should probably throw millions of dollars at elizabeth banks for no good reason whatsoever but for the fact that i'm not attached to the property i don't hold it near and dear to my heart sure i think they're probably a good fit for each it, other i'll buy it it makes sense why they gave her the movie the second pitch perfect we all agree it wasn't directed well it made a lot of money yeah, yeah. yeah. a ton of money so you want to, even if it's not going to be directed well it's just like well she had the magic touch last time you know <laughs> right. do you know direct a garbage can commercial yeah, well, that right. had a lot to do with the first one it being so good. It absolutely and did, but you know, it's still it. The money still shows. That's the stat that she goes into the meeting with. My money made this, and it's hard to argue with it. Can you excited about Elizabeth Banks directing Charlie's Angels? Uh, I'm gonna buy this. I like a lot of people here at this table. I'm an Elizabeth Banks mark. I, I like what she's done on screen. I didn't see Pitch Perfect 2. I'm not uh, going to disagree with anything you guys are saying about how it was, but I do agree with what you're saying. This is kind of put those things together. You made money. It's going to do fun, sexy, fun explosions and all that kind of good stuff. I don't think you need Scorsese directing it and give her that chance to improve. And I think you guys are suggesting that, too. Hey, maybe maybe she could get better. Um, but uh, I, I like it. The first the movie was set, first movie was 17 years ago. Wow. So <laughs> it's wow. it's okay to reboot it. Was it really? 17 years really? ago, 2000, uh, the first one. Wow. So you know uh, if Spider Man's being rebooted right now, on top of what we're already seeing in the trailers today, um, I'm okay with it. And uh, well, Jeremy, I did grow up with that TV show, and uh, Jacqueline Smith can do anything she wants in the world. Uh, so I am okay with this. This I'm going to buy it and uh, hope for the best. All right, guys, listen, I want to remind you that uh, Movie Talk is not the only show on Collider Video. Just yesterday, a brand new episode of our movie trivia, Schmodown, aired. Of course, with Team IGN taking on Team Rotten Tomatoes. And this Friday, you might want to keep your eye open. We've got a very special, actually, why don't you tell everybody about it, a very special uh, movie trivia, Schmodown, on Friday. Yeah, we were very excited to get a, a phone call from the people over at uh, Lionsgate, and, and we, we were going to uh, Jonathan Reese Myers and Brian Goodman, who are in the brand new movie, Black Butterfly with Antonio Banderas comes out this week. They did a schmodown, and it, it is a schmodown between the director and Jonathan Rhys Myers, of course, also from Tudors and from Vikings. Vikings, Vikings, yeah. Vikings Mission Impossible 3. Mission Impossible 3. Um, so it it's going to be a lot of fun for you guys to see, and it's this Friday. Make sure you check it out. Keep supporting those things. Leave comments and likes on those. That's how you get more, because, because of the Power Rangers one and because of everything else. Now more studios are coming to us to have these special matches for you guys. So thank you so much for that. It's going to be fun. I also want to let you know that our uh, Pirates of the Caribbean Dead Men Tell No Tales review is up. It's up there on the channel right now. Go and check that out. Of course, every Friday, awesome tacular with this man, <sighs> Jeremy Johns, on the Verizon Go 90 network. Make sure you check that out. All right, we're going to save a little bit of time at the end of the show. Take some of your live Twitter questions. You can start sending those in now. Just make sure you're following us at Collider Video. First, we're going to go to the mailbag. Ashley, what's in the mailbag today? Jonathan writes, hey, Collider crew. My question to you is, J.J. Abrams has now revived three franchises in his run as a film director, Mission Impossible, Star Trek, and Star Wars, with Super 8 being his only original project. We haven't heard from him in a while for directing, so I was wondering, what would you like to see him do next? Would you rather see him do something original, reboot another franchise, or go back to Star Trek as his next film? Keep up the great work. I think, honestly, I think his, his hero is Steven Spielberg, and I honestly think he would love to take his career at this point more and more the direction Steven Spielberg has done, which is really more producing. Uh, more producing and direct once in a while when something really comes up that he's really passionate about. And Spielberg's got a couple of projects he's working on as a director now, too, so maybe that'll change it. I would really like to see Abrams go back to, not to doing television, but to the type of stuff he did on television. Like, Alias, I am just bog... Yeah. Well, that's one of the reasons why, to this day... Um, there's not many laws of men that I wouldn't break for Jennifer Garner. And that all started <laughs> That all started on Alias. I loved what he did on Alias. Obviously, he, had, he got his, he cut all of his teeth in, in uh, television, the type of stuff he used to do in television. So I would love to see like a lighthearted, fun kind of spy movie for him to do on the big screen. Not necessarily Alias the movie, but I'd like to see him do something like that at this point. I know, Christian, you hear about this. What would you like J J.J. to do at this I was point? going the same place. I think he should do television. I think J.J. Uh, Abrams is actually a much better long-term storyteller. I think that uh, sometimes in movies he's condensed and all of the big ideas that he has, he's got to tell in two hours and it doesn't play as much. Um, I 
enjoy The Force Awakens very much, to be honest. But I understand a lot of the grievances for people and things that they have problems with that movie. But you can't deny that exactly what this uh, viewer is saying. He's revived three franchises because Mission. You, for, you forget to give him the credit for Mission Impossible. Mm -hmm. After I mean, Mission Impossible Two almost sunk it. That John Woo movie was coffish. <laughs> but uh, but the fact he got it back on track. He did the same thing with Star Trek, and he did it with Star Wars. He can do it with other movies. I wouldn't mind seeing him produce uh, Flash Gordon. I know that they already have that kind of in the works. Do, well, not him, but somebody else. That would be cool. He knows science fiction very well. He knows fantasy very well. I'd like to see him do that in the film world. But I think John's right. I think television is a good place for him to develop new things, whether it's you know with Linda Lof or with, with Brian Burke's always going to be doing stuff with him. So that's what I'd like to see him do because he's so creative and so interesting in the television space that I think more of his original ideas come through TV. The examples that we gave, none of them are original except like Super 8. So I would say go back to TV. You got something you want to add to that? Yeah, Charlie's Angels brought to you by <laughs> J.J. Abrams. There you go right there. Sorry, Elizabeth Banks. I would di actually, actually, I would jump all over actually, a, a, a J.J. Abrams directed Charlie's Angels. That would be great. I, I was just joking around. Then after I said it, I was like, oh, shit, that's a good idea. <laughs> uh, uh, Uncharted, I mean, there have been rumblings about yeah. that. I know I know that I mean, has, Uncharted has to have a director at this point, right? But, I mean, if... It said 19. Yeah, it said yeah. 19. Carnahan was supposed to do it at one yeah. point, I think. Yeah, the, it's, had, it's had a few, a kid, right? Yeah, Tom, yeah. But, um, just, just play the game. Yeah. Right, so yeah, just play the game. But if they're going to make an Uncharted movie, that's probably a director that would get me more excited for an Uncharted movie. Other than that, I have the game. But isn't it David Ayer? Is he doing it? Uncharted? What's David Ayer going to announce? This I don't week, know. Yes. Who knows? Where am I? Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, I echo everything you guys are saying. I actually agree with you, John, that he seems very comfortable in that producing role. He seems like, I thought he was going to have a little bit more to do with maybe eight and nine. Maybe doesn't seem like that's the case right now in the Star Wars universe. Uh, TV's great. I, I, I'd li like to see him uh, an original like adventure. You say Uncharted. I said like an original one. Mm -hmm. Be like Spielberg even more. Do the, an Indiana Jones for a new generation. Mm -hmm. Something like that would be kind of fun. All right, guys, I said we take some time to take your live Twitter questions, and we're going to do that right now. So, Wendy, what have you picked out? The first one comes from Louise Rivera, who writes, Now, with Top Gun 2 being made, what other 80s movies do you want a sequel or reboot? For me, it's Back to the Future. Oh. Um, it'll, the Back to the Future one will happen eventually. I think Star Wars will happen eventually. Eventually, that might be take 20 years, it might take 30 years. I, I just, eventually is a long time. But everything gets rebooted now and again. I honestly can't think, I can think of a couple of movies that I really want to, I would love to see sequels to, but rebooting, um, gosh, no, I really can't. I mean, the one I go back to normally when people say, what old movie do you really want to see picked up again, like as a sequel? But I don't think it was the 80s, but it's Mystery Men. I really, I <laughs> love, I, even today, actually even maybe more today yeah. than ever. Mystery Men was so far ahead of its time. It was great. With We're number one. Everyone else is two or lower. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. It's, it's fantastic. So that's what I usually go to, but it's not an 80s one. I got a couple for you. I got, uh, we've talked about it many times in this show before, and that's The Last Starfighter. Although oh, yeah. it's, it's never going to happen because the guy won't they, give up the they're rights. They're talking about it. The guy won't they're give up the rights. Um, so. Time Bandits is another one I would love to see happen again. Uh, I, Secret and Nim, I think, is happening. I'd like to see Secret and Nim happen, but I just mentioned it in our last story, and that's Flash Gordon. They keep talking about it. Matthew Vaughn at one point was supposed to direct it. Yeah, that's going to happen. It's but it's, I haven't heard any news about it. And I think because of you know Matthew Vaughn doing Secret Service and or Kingsman again, I want to see Flash Gordon happen. I don't want to. And I, at one point they were rumoring it like this is years ago with Ashton Kutcher and like a comedy type of thing. I want them to go away from the camp and turn it serious because I think it's an overall serious franchise. So I hope Flash Gordon comes back. We'll see. Anything from you guys? Yeah, they're already remaking Dune, so I'm pretty All happy right, about yeah. that. I want to see Dune. Uh, Logan's Run, just any of those, like, you know, Last Starfighter. Mm -hmm. those, Man, those... Brian Singer, for the longest time, yeah. was all about right. Logan's Run. He was going to do it, and he talked, and then it just kind of fell by the wayside. It'd be a great, it'd be a great remake. You know, there, there are a lot of these these old classics that didn't have the budget or technology to really show what the story could do, and anything like that, uh, I think Dune is included in that, can, uh, can benefit from a re remake or a reboot. Um, DC Cab, 1983. Nice. Mr. Macker, T. Mr. T. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know. I figure at some point every property from the 80s is going to get a shot again. So you know, I, I told the story on Mailbag the other day, but I remember the first time ever. I was really young. I don't even know how I remember this, but this is the first time my parents went out and rent. This is back in the day when people didn't, and not everybody had VHS players. My parents went out and rented for the weekend a laser disc player. Oh yeah. Ooh. And when you rented the laser disc, you got two movies. Mm -hmm. And those two movies my parents brought home 
was DC Cab nice. with Mr. T and Dr. Detroit with Dan Aykroyd. <laughs> Those are the two movies they brought Reboot back. Reboot so Dr. Detroit. Can't go um, <laughs> you know, the, the Back to the Future thing is another thing I wanted to address real quick. The idea of a reboot is something I don't really want to see at all. I think that it's a harder thing to do, but the idea of a sequel because of time travel in general mm -hmm. and some new kid finding the DeLorean and whether or not you put uh, Doc Brown in there or, some, or someone else, I think Tom Holland would be very interesting in a Back to the Future remake. I mean, I'd rather see him do that than well, the silly Well, if you look at the Nathan new Spider-Man thing, he's basically Michael Marty J. McFly. Fox. Yeah. He's yeah. Marty McFly. I would, I would I mean, much really, rather see yeah. that than that silly Nathan Drake prequel thing. I, I, got, I got something. Uh, Inner Space. Yes. You know, oh, yeah, 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 that's a good yeah, one. Meg Ryan, Dennis yeah. Quaid, yeah, it's Martin Short. Yeah, yeah. Dude, can short you want to go home and just watch that yeah, night? I do. I have it on Blu-ray, dude. <laughs> Bye. I love the use of Sam Jones in that movie. All right, what's next? <laughs> what is that movie? Is it where the witches are turning the kids into rats? Is that called Witches? And was Star that an Wars. 80s movie? <laughs> 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 what did you say? I was going to say, where, where the witches are, I thought you were going to go with Witches of Eastwick, yeah, but uh, which is another great one, by the way. Where the witches are turning kids into rats. I don't remember that one. that... Huh? You guys, it's called Witches. It's, yeah. is that, I don't know if that's an '80s movie. Is but this I, a I dream like you had, Wendy? <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna move on to the next question. Um, all right, college movie man writes: Who is a well-liked mainstream director whose work just doesn't click with you? Hmm. Oh, <laughs> sorry. I just I was talking Flash Gordon. I said Sam Jones, and I meant Sam Cook. <laughs> um, a, a well-respected. Uh, oh, well, for, for me, it's so it's uh, Tim. Uh, uh, why am I forgetting his last name? Uh, for what? Pee-wee's Big Adventure. Oh, Burton. Burton? Tim Burton. I, I, for whatever reason, you know what's funny? My, the, the, my favorite Tim Burton film is actually the Tim Burton film that Tim Burton fans hate the most, which I actually liked his uh, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. I mean, it was always obviously nowhere near as good as the original stuff. Uh, but yeah, Burton's films for me, for whatever reason... Um, I know Schnepp has gotten together with, with him uh, several times, and Schnepp he's a very nice guy, very cool guy. Uh, but for whatever reason, generally speaking, he's got a couple films that work for me, but overall, his, his style just usually doesn't click with me. So, so, sorry, the overall question was which ones you feel is a little... Which, which is a well-respected director today whose movies just don't work for you, generally? You know, there's two movies of Del Toro's that I love. And that's Pan's Labyrinth. Um, I didn't mind Pacific Rim, but um, you know, and uh, Pan's Labyrinth actually, and Hellboy. The first, uh, the first Hellboy, I really, I really enjoyed a lot. And even the second was okay. Blade Two, yeah, Blade Two was okay. Oh, Blade um, Two, but it was awesome. okay. But I, I mean, the, the thing is, I think Del Toro, and I, and he came in here. I had the pleasure of interviewing him um, for Fandango two years ago too. And I don't know if there's a nicer dude than Del Toro. He's awesome. I think that people have put him on this particular pedestal that I haven't put him on yet. Um, but I think he's a great producer. I just I, his movies just haven't responded. I haven't responded to his movies the way that other people have. You guys yeah, I, I, I'm gonna go ahead and say it. Um, Cohen Brothers are fifty fifty for yeah. me. They're about yeah. fifty fifty for me. Yeah, they and were so, on a real hot streak for a bit. Then they they were. were on a real cold streak. Yeah, and and it's funny because their cold streak. I I watched the movies like yeah, this, you know, it's fifty fifty, and a lot of people are like, what happened to them? Like that's kind of how it goes sometimes with the Cohen brothers for me. So it was nothing unusual for me. So they they remain fifty fifty for me. I said it on movie talk. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really, honestly, I don't have an answer. Yeah, I that's, tell me, that's when you got to think I, I, about. Because, you know, I, I can, you know, I'm a huge Coen Brothers fan. I'm a huge Wes Anderson fan. Wes Anderson changed my life. I haven't really enjoyed one of his mm, last three or four movies like I did the early ones mm -hmm. there. Right. Doesn't mean I consider him overrated. It just means times change. I don't know. Even mm -hmm. Tarantino connected with me years ago doesn't connect with me as much now. It's, it's, a, it's a tough question to answer. I do awesome. want to see Tarantino. I didn't mean to cut you off. I do no, want to see Charlie's Angels? Uh, yes, Charlie's Angels by Quentin Tarantino. <laughs> I do want to see him do something th like in the 20th century, you know what I mean? Like in the 90s, like a 90s yeah. crime, because yeah. now it's kind of a throwback. At the time he started doing movies, it was the times, right. you know? So I'd like to see him do another 90s crime movie. What's he doing next? I, I don't think he's announced it. Yeah. Lick, lick and toes. He said it's his, his, <laughs> his, his last one, right? Yeah, he, he said, said. 10. He's All right. 10. Oh, he's last 10. question of the day. All right, this one comes from Ina, who writes, what is your definition of success for Wonder Woman in terms of box office and review scores? Um, I think, well, box office. As long as it's profitable, it's fine. As long as it's profitable, it's fine. This is the first new age of comic book films, female-led superhero movie. We've had a bunch of them in the past, but not since you know the new incarnation of the new era yeah. of superhero since films. Since it took it seriously. Yeah, so, so as long as it's profitable, which I think it needs to hit the 400 million range uh, to be profitable, and I think it'll do it. I think it'll open... I know they were saying 
they're projecting like 65 million. I think it'll crack 80 or higher uh, opening weekend. And like I've, I've been saying this for months now, it's going to be the first DCEU film that cracks 75% on Rotten Tomatoes. I think the critics are going to really like this film. I think the audience is going to like this film. I'm actually heading out in about five hours to go and watch the movies, and I'm super stoked about that. Um, but I, I, like, I think there are some people out there saying, it's got to make a billion dollars. What? Yeah, Are you I'm kidding sure. me? <laughs> no, it does not need to make a billion dollars to be considered a set drop. This thing hits 500 million worldwide. The, the execs over at Warner Brothers are dancing a jig. I mean, that'll be awesome. Um, so, yeah, I, I think you got to keep all that in mind. Look, it's a film that is coming off of a couple of divisive films in the DC Cinematic Universe. It's the first female-led one that we've had in a while. So I think you don't need to set success marks at like 800 million higher. I think it will be successful, and I think most people will realize that the numbers it hits will be a success. I don't know, what do you think, Jeremy? Uh, my thought is, for me personally, myself, as long as I come out of there going, hey, it was a good time, no alcohol required, per my rating system, I'll be happy. For the general masses, since uh, I don't think studios care about my stuff, uh, I think the studio would probably want to see it be uh, a fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. So as long as there is a fresh mark there, I feel like that's like, okay, will take that win. Granted, I mean, there are different variants of fresh. I'm sure they want it as high as it could possibly go, but as long as it's fresh, I think they'll be happy with it. Um, in the first week of its release, as long as it breaks $100 million worldwide, if, if it has to make $400 million, I think that's completely possible. So yeah, as long as it makes its money back and is fresh on Rotten Tomatoes, I think the studio will be like, okay, we can move forward. Yeah, I think one of the benchmarks it needs is that opening weekend, that, that thing where you all look around and go, oh, that made money, it's opening weekend. It, right. it didn't flop. It wasn't one of those things. Uh, but I also, the, the synchronicity of critics and fans is encouraging or will be encouraging once it hits. It, it's shaping up to be that. And I, I, I overall, it's going to make Transformers makes money. You know what I mean? All these movies, it's going to make money. But I think that opening weekend is key because that kind of determines for a lot of people if it's successful. I actually had somebody argue with me the other day that, well, Guardians of the Galaxy 2 made a hundred. 145 million opening weekend. Wonder Woman is a far better known character. Wonder Woman minimum needs to make 145 million opening weekend. It's like Guardians of the Galaxy 2, though, is coming off an incredibly successful first film of its own thing, but it's in a cinematic universe as well that each film gets, gets celebrated by audience and critics. It's got all the momentum on its side. You cannot compare mm. the two, and therefore you cannot set the same standards for a Wonder Woman opening weekend. That would be completely unfair. I just I just don't think that's rational. Yeah, I, yeah. No offense to whoever you're talking about. That's a very, very silly argument because uh, Guardians of the Galaxy uh, is part of this Marvel cinematic universe, and the reason the first one did so well is because all of the success and great movies that came before it, as where Wonder Woman is fighting, it doesn't matter how well known she is, she's fighting against what have been, like you said, divisive as far as some people like certain of these things. Overall, critics have not really liked them. If it does well, if it does like 75% on, on Rotten Tomatoes and it can open up at like 60, 70 million and just start, you have good word of mouth and start building up. And like you guys said, 400, 500 worldwide. I think that's success. And I, I really think that that's going to happen because I, if we go back after hearing like the early buzz and I am going to see it tonight uh, also, but you won't hear from me because I don't break embargo. Um, <laughs> I'm going to actually go through uh, and, and I'll wait. And then, but I do think after hearing certain things, I think that um, this movie has a shot to be in the top five now. And I, I, I had originally not put it in there too, but hearing the positive buzz that's coming out and because of, because Wonder Woman is this iconic character, and if they deliver in a way that you go and see this movie and go, wow, that was something, it's got a good shot. All right, guys, that'll do it for us for this installment of Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to thank the people sitting at the table with me. Over here at the Pit Boss, Mr. Ken Knapsack. Hey, Ken, where can people find you online? That's right. Speaking of the Pit Boss, you can find me online at Ken Knapsack. But this Thursday, that's tomorrow, 2 p.m. PST, live on Collider's Facebook page, the first episode of Collider's Inside Schmodown. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to go inside the stories, the results, the controversies, all the personalities of Movie Trivia Schmodown. Right beside me, star, of course, awesome tacular with Jeremy Johns. Mr. Jeremy Johns, where can people find you? He called me a star. Star, I've made it. You can find me at Jeremy Johns on YouTube and Twitter. Rest of the internet, you can find my show Awesome Tacular on Go90, where Christian and I talk Star Wars. Also, do a lot of fun, nerdy stuff. Be there. You will love it. Sitting right beside me, star of Collider Jedi Council, Mr. Christian Harloff. That will be going on tomorrow. We're going to be covering all the Vanity Fair stuff. Yes, we're going to be going through our, our theories, our speculations on Jedi Council tomorrow. And also, like we talked about just before, Jonathan Reese Myers versus Brian Goodman on the movie Trivia Schmodown. Also, check out IGN and Rotten Tomatoes, Clammy Hands. One of the other stars of Awesome Tacular, Miss Ashley Mova. Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, Ashley Mova. Happy Wednesday, guys. 
And just the overall star, Wendy Lee. Oh, that's so sweet. That was cute. <laughs> uh, the Movie Couple channel on YouTube, at Wendy Lee Zaney on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. And you guys can simply follow me on Facebook and on Twitter, just at John Campia. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks so much for joining us, and until next time, bye-bye. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.